Welcome everyone to this Hansard Society webinar on the retained EU law revocation and reform bill. We're really pleased to have you join us today. I'm Bridget Fowler, a senior researcher at the Society, and I hope you'll agree that we've got a fantastic panel uh, to discuss the bill with us today from three different perspectives. Um, first up, we're very pleased to have with us Sir Jonathan Jones KC, who will be well known to many of you as the former head of the government legal department. That's a post he held during, among other things, the passage of what became the EU Withdrawal Act 2018, EUA, which is the precursor of the bill we're discussing today. So Jonathan is obviously coming at the bill primarily from the perspective of the law. Second up, we have Dr. Ruth Fox, who is the director of the Hansard Society, who will de discuss the bill primarily from the Hansard Society perspective, that is in terms of parliament and its relationship with the executive. And so focusing on the bill's delegated powers and the parliamentary scrutiny of the use of those powers by ministers and other authorities. This is against a backdrop in which there are already serious and rising concerns about uh, this issue. Third, we have Lord Anderson of Ipswich, David Anderson, who is the former independent reviewer of terrorism legislation and is also a barrister, but will today be speaking primarily in his capacity as a working crossbench peer. So he will be focusing in particular on what the House of Lords might do with the bill when it reaches there. Just to do a bit of housekeeping, we're aiming to conclude our panelists prepared remarks within half an hour or so, uh, so that we leave ourselves a good half an hour for discussion. If you have a question that you'd like discussed, please post it using the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen at any time, um, where you can also upvote any of your colleagues questions that you'd especially like to see best uh, during the discussion. Um, if we get a lot of questions in, um, that upvoting process would help me select the ones to pose to our panellists. If your question is directed at a particular panellist, it would be helpful if you could indicate that, please. Um, we're live tweeting today's event from the Hansard Society Twitter account using the hashtag REUL. And if anybody refers to any resources or anything that uh, during the discussion, we'll try to tweet the links there as well. We're recording today's event and the recording will be posted on the Hansard Society website uh, within a few days. Some of our discussion today will, um, will be a little bit detailed and a bit complicated and, and technical. Um, this is unavoidable, um, partly um, because of the nature of the bill, um, but we also do want today's discussion to be useful to those of you who will need to engage directly with it, whether you're in parliament, in Whitehall, or in civil society. But um, if it helps to have a sort of overarching point to hang on to and to frame our discussion today, um, it, it seems to us that the, the most fundamental provision of the bill is quite straightforward and um, enacts what is a basic political decision, which is to apply a sunset to retain EU law. Once the bill is enacted, essentially the, the status quo for retained EU law will no longer be available after the sunset. The default will be that this law falls. And for that not to happen, ministers and possibly parliamentarians will have to do something. And most of the detailed issues that we will be discussing today effectively flow from that basic political decision to apply the sunset. Right, I think that's all I have to say. So um, on that note, I will um, hand over to Sir Jonathan and ask him to uh, open our discussion, please. Sir Jonathan. Thank you very much, Bridget. And thank you to the Hansard Society for hosting this event and asking me to take part in it. So I really want to cover three things uh, in my short slot. First of all, I'll say something about the background to the legislation and why we have retained EU law in the first place. Secondly, I want to say something about the implications of the bill for legal certainty. And thirdly, I will touch on the nature of the powers which the bill confers on 
ministers, including the devolved authorities. Uh, so first of all, on the background, as Bridget said, I was working for the government uh, at the time of the 2016 referendum, uh, and then during the passage of what is now the EU Withdrawal Act 2018. And one of the earliest conversations I had after the referendum result was about the legal structures we would need to secure an orderly, a legally orderly exit from the EU. And it was clear we would need some way of carrying forward the large body of EU law, which would become part of our domestic law during the period of our membership, if we were to avoid, well, legal chaos in truth, if we were to avoid major gaps and uncertainty in the law. Uh, and the result was the EU Withdrawal Act 2018, as I've said, and that created the concept of retained EU law. Uh, the Act said that this law was to continue as part of uh, UK national law until Parliament chose to change it, of course. I also said very broadly that this pre-existing EU law was to continue to be interpreted in the same way as before. So, for example, EU case law was also retained, along with the principles established under that case law and the doctrine of supremacy, which we may come back to, but it's basically the doctrine under which EU law now our retained EU law prevails over any other now uh, inconsistent national law. So those principles and those modes of interpretation were also retained so that as far as possible, the law would continue to have the same meaning as it had had during our membership. At the same time, it was recognised that some retained EU law would need to be adapted so as to work technically once the UK had left the EU to reflect the fact that we were no longer a member state of the third country, to remove or change references to the EU institutions and, and change some of the other terminology so as to ensure that the law worked. And so the 2018 Act contained a power for ministers to make regulations to deal with what were called deficiencies in retaining EU law, make the necessary technical and terminological changes, and in fact many hundreds of sets of regulations were made to do that. And as I say, the aim overall was just to make the changes necessary for the law to work, but otherwise to secure as much legal certainty and predictability and continuity as possible, and therefore minimal legal disruption to businesses and to consumers and citizens and every other user of the law. And by and large, I would say that has worked. So whatever you think of the merits of Brexit, the legal process has been tolerably smooth. And as far as I'm aware, there's been very little litigation, only a very small number of cases, about the meaning of retained EU law. Um, so the 2018 Act and the regulations made under it, by and large, gave businesses and citizens the legal certainty they needed. Uh, and bear in mind that this was all sanctioned by an act of the UK Parliament. The retained EU law is now UK domestic law. And obviously now we've left the EU, Parliament can change any aspect of retained EU law at once. The normal way of doing that would be for the government to bring forward a bill on any particular topic, perhaps consult on it, and members of both houses would debate it and would be able to table amendments to it. And when enacted, it will become law and the UK courts would give effect to it. But the retained EU law bill, which I'll call it for short, takes a different approach. Instead, it asks Parliament to take the whole block of retained EU law in one go. The explanatory notes to the bill say this amounts to over 2,400 pieces of retained EU law. And it provides, as Bridget said, that this all automatically expires unless ministers decide otherwise. And it changes the way in which this law is to be interpreted and it gives very wide powers to ministers to amend or replace it. Uh, it also, by the way, changes the, the nomenclature so that retained EU law which survives this process becomes assimilated law. 
So I'll just expand a bit on that. Uh, clause one provides that most retained EU law expires at the end of 2023, unless ministers decide to retain it. That deadline can itself be extended by ministers by regulations for specific legislation, specific, specific uh, instruments or categories of legislation to any date up to the 23rd of June 2026. So we don't even have certainty about the sunset date. I can say a bit more about the nature of the powers conferred by the bill a bit later. The explanatory notes say that the sunset give, gives businesses certainty by setting the new date by which a new domestic statute book tailored to the UK's needs and regulatory regimes will come into effect. But as I've noted, there is in fact no certainty about the date, is it, it can be moved. And there can be no certainty about which elements of retained EU law ministers will decide to keep or amend or replace. Uh, the explanatory notes, which I've already mentioned, the explanatory notes are technically very thorough and helpful, but they give no indications of any particular legal or policy areas which the government thinks should either be retained or changed. So at the time of passing this bill, assuming it is passed, neither Parliament nor businesses nor anyone else can know what the substantive law will be by the end of 2023, which after all is not much more than a year away, in any area currently covered by EU law, which of course spans so much of the statute book and the whole period of, of our membership of the EU. This is all treated as Brussels red tape. It will all go, in one sense, um, but we have no way of knowing what, if anything, will replace it. And this is all going to require much work by my former colleagues, civil servants, to determine which aspects of this law should be kept and which should be changed within a very tight timetable, which is of the government's choosing. But the default position, which again Richard has touched on, is that if no conscious decision is made to keep a particular piece of retained EU law with or without amendments, or indeed if a particular piece of retained EU law is missed by accident, it will automatically expire on the sunset date with no further involvement by Parliament at all. But at the moment, we simply don't know what will happen to any particular law. The other area of uncertainty arises from the abolition of the principle of supremacy of EU law, uh, along with the abolition of the general principles of EU law. And the bill also gives greater provision for the UK courts to depart from prior case law in the interpretation of retained EU law. So I don't really have time to go into those really quite complex provisions, um, which may be partly symbolic in, in that they they distance or detach domestic law from the previous trappings of EU law, but they're also undoubtedly intended to change the way the law is actually interpreted and applied, otherwise why would we be doing it? And the trouble again is that no examples are given of any particular areas of law or factual situations or real world situations where it is intended that the law should change. So, for example, what are the particular provisions of retained EU law which currently prevail over inconsistent domestic law? In other words, where, what, where are the areas that supremacy currently applies, but where the government thinks that's a problem and would like to reverse that position? Again, we don't know. It will be left to parties to litigate potentially in the courts to decide. And that, I think, is, again, uh, an, a problem for legal service. Finally, third point, the, the scope of the powers conferred on ministers. Uh, again, we haven't got time, uh, time to go through the full detail of the bill and others may touch on this, but the powers include a power to move the sunset date, as I've said, a power to restate secondary retained EU law, uh, including, by the way, power to provide that the equivalent of supremacy and EU law principles continue to apply to it. Um, so on the one hand, 
uh, the bill abolishes those principles, but in deciding to retain particular aspects of changing EU law, ministers can reinstate those principles. So that's quite a complicated concept. And the power includes that. Uh, there's a power to restate assimilated law. So this retained EU law becomes assimilated law, and that can then later be restated uh, or reproduced. Um, and in doing that, the minister can use different words and make changes to resolve ambiguities and doubts and anomalies and so on. So there's quite a flexible power there to restate and reproduce what was previously retained EU law. There's power to revoke secondary retained EU law without replacing it. There's power to revoke and replace retained EU law. I, I think these are very wide powers with, with such alternative provision as the minister considers appropriate, although there are some limitations on what can be done under that power uh, and provision that in exercising it, ministers can't increase the overall regulatory burden. So there are some limitations on what, what is still, I think, a wide power. And there's also a power to update any secondary retained EU law in any way the minister thinks appropriate to take account of changes in technology or developments in scientific understanding at clause 16. So um, in summary, these are very wide powers to revoke, restate and amend large parts of the statute book. Um, I think Ruth may say something later about the parliamentary procedures which are to apply um, to the exercise of these powers and they do vary. Um, but the truth is that you know, there are limits on the extent to which Parliament will be able to scrutinise the extent of these powers. Um, and that's a very familiar theme uh, to the hands on society, certainly, but to a number of us. Um, and we may come back to that. So I think that's probably the end of my, my time. My summary would be this, that the bill opens the way to major changes in our law major changes in the way in which retained EU law operates or ceases to operate in our domestic law. It doesn't of itself make any substantive legal or policy change. That is all left to the decisions of ministers or to the automatic sunset provision, if ministers don't do anything, and to the courts in the way they approach the change rules on the status and interpretation of retained EU law. Uh, and it gives major power to the executive and the devolved administrations to decide what the law will actually be. So there I will pause. Thank you very much. So Jonathan, thank you very much. That was a, a great um, introduction, over, an overview of the bill, and I will pass seamlessly on to our director, Ruth Fox, who I think is going to focus on the delegated powers and their scrutiny, as you indicate. Ruth. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank, thanks, Bridget. Um, well, moving from what Jonathan said, I mean, I, I, as things stand, the, the bill in its present form, um, unless it's amended, um, parliamentarians are being invited essentially to give ministers a cliff edge power without knowing what if any pieces of retained EU law may be thrown off the cliff on sunset day. And um, the problem for, for, for MPs and peers will be that, that at the time they grant the powers, they may not know what the government intends to do with them in policy terms. So the only thing we've really got to steer on is that the financial services aspects of retained EU law have already been carved out into the financial services and markets bill, but everything else is pretty much up for review. And the only clue we've got as to government thinking is, well, tune into the Today programme on the morning and, and hear what ministers are saying, but also clause 15, which indicates that um, the direction of travel in terms of the government's thinking is, is essentially one way in favour of deregulation. So, um, you know, from the perspective of parliamentarians, um, including you know, government backbenchers as well as, as the opposition, if they have concerns about the prospects of policy and, and legislation and rule being lost, then um, you know, there may be nothing they can do about it if they grant the powers in the bill as they're presently set out, because government won't have to do anything at all. It could be a completely you know, non-action on their part and the legislation will, will fall, fall away. 
So one of the things parliamentarians, I think, need to do is to get ministers to clarify their intentions, both about policy direction and how different departmental areas are going to be uh, de dealt with, the ruling areas like the environment and transport and so on, which have huge swathes of retained EU law to deal with, but also to think about the trigger points and the timings here, which are going to impact on both government and parliament, because um, you know, if decisions have all got to be made by the end of next year, but in theory under the bill, decisions don't have to be made until right at the sunset. Um, how are we going to know whether that's uh, Parliament, whether that's civil society, how are we going to know what the government's intentions are? Are they going to let the legislation, the regulations fall away or are they going to replace and, 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 and amend them? Are they going to trigger the sunset extension clause to, to adopt a later sunset for particular areas of policy? So there's, a, there's going to be a potential for a lack of clarity um, about, about the timings and um, you know, the, the direction of, of policy going forward through to the, the last date when a sunset can apply, which is 23rd of June 2026, which of course is the symbolic 10 year anniversary of the, of the EU referendum. So legislative clarity and, and, and concern about the use of parliamentary time, assuming that the bill is going to hit the Lords perhaps by Christmas at best, it then goes into the, to the Lords for a period of time because of the nature of the powers and the fact that it's, it's powers, not policy, it's gonna get, uh, as I'm sure David's going to talk about, going to get quite a lot of, of focused attention there. Um, it's going to take time for it to get royal assent. The powers can't be used until royal assent is granted. Of course, the department civil servants can be reviewing uh, retained EU law now and planning for what's going to happen. But there are going to be issues um, in terms of the use of parliamentary time next year unless decisions are made in a quite timely way and the programme for regulations is, is, is carefully planned. So nobody, no, nobody's interest for everything to go to, to the wire. An issue with the, the, the bill as it's currently framed is, is the broad and ambiguous wording of some of the powers and the, the extent to which they grant considerable discretion to ministers. So as, as Jonathan said, we haven't got time today to go through all of them, but I just wanted to flag clause 15 first, which provides for the replacement or revocation of secondary retained EU law, um, which the Hansel Society and others I think have described as the do anything we want power with just a few caveats. Um, and this power allows UK ministers and, and devolved ministers of, of which more shortly to replace ret direct retained EU law with provisions they consider to be appropriate and to achieve the same or similar objectives or to make such alternative provisions as they consider appropriate. Now, firstly, there's no check or restrictions on the requirement, sorry, no, no requirement to retain the same checks or restrictions that existed, uh, for example, consultation uh, in, in the legislation that's being replaced. The clause permits some of the things that have been excluded from the broad ambit of powers in, in other bills, um, subdelegation, creation of cr criminal offences, imposition of monetary penalties and so on. Um, but ultimately, for parliamentarians, the question is, what does correspond and similar mean? What, what is being left to ministerial discretion? And similarly, Clause 16 states that ministers may make modifications that they consider appropriate to take account of changes in technology or developments in scientific understanding. Now, if you think about that, just because something's scientific doesn't mean it's necessarily wholly technical. These could be quite considerable big areas of policy. Think genetic modified organisms, think net zero, um, think artificial intelligence. Um, would this power enable ministers to make significant changes in areas like this in the future? And what does consider appropriate to take account of actually therefore in practice mean? Should it be left to ministerial discretion? Should this actually be something that's left to primary legislation? And given that this clause 16 power is subject to the negative scrutiny procedure, actually should it be upgraded to the affirmative procedure so that parliamentarians have to actively uh, debate uh, and, and approve it? Coming on to the parliamentary scrutiny issues, um, there, there are two aspects. So this, this bill retains, I think, to the government's credit, retains the sifting procedure that was in the EU Withdrawal Act and also subsequently in the um, EU um, Future Relationship Act in relation to three clauses. There's a case for extending it beyond those three clauses, but, it, but it's in there for, 
principles as 12, 13 and 15. And what this means in practice is that ministers, you know, if they want to lay a, a proposed negative, they do so in draft before Parliament um, with a memorandum from the minister explaining why they think the negative procedure is appropriate. And then a sifting committee uh, in each house considers whether they think that's appropriate or whether they want to upgrade it to the affirmative scrutiny procedure. And they've got 10 days to make that decision. And then um, the government can take that away and either accept or um, if it doesn't agree with that decision, it can um, you know, write a statement explaining why. Now, sifting is better than nothing, but it's still, you know, in the context of delegated legislation, scrutiny procedures, it's still a fairly toothless process uh, and doesn't give parliamentarians a lot of traction. That's not a problem arising from this bill. It's a problem arising from the scrutiny of delegated uh, legislation generally. Um, it will facilitate dialogue between um, departments and, and the relevant scrutiny committees, but that's um, that, that's broadly about it. The second element that they have in, in, included in the bill is the legislative reform order process, um, which my colleague Tom West um, spotted uh, just before recess. So if you want to, I haven't got time to go through what an LRO is, but if you want to read about that, he's got a blog on our website back in, in July. Um, but the requirements of an LRO essentially uh, provide for a much higher level of scrutiny, um, known broadly as the super affirmative procedure. They're relatively rare. There have been only 40 since the Legislative and Regulatory Reform Act was passed in 2006. So significantly fewer than was originally anticipated, in part because the requirements are so high and it's also time consuming and resource intensive. So our best expectation is that although the procedure is in there as a backstop, it's probably going to be used quite rarely. And finally, if I may, just a couple of minutes on the implications for the devolved governments, because a number of powers here can be used by a UK minister in Whitehall or in the relevant devolved administrations in areas of devolved competence, or they can act jointly. And there's clearly a lot of tension between uh, the devolved governments and Whitehall on the question where if a UK minister wants to act unilaterally in an area of devolved competence, and you can see that in the correspondence that um, ministers have had on this bill, and also the, um, the Welsh Parliament, the Senate, gets the sifting procedure for instruments arising from this bill, but the Scottish Parliament doesn't. Now that may be resolved by an informal concordat or protocol subsequently, but it's interesting that there are different provisions for scrutiny reflecting, uh, reflecting the different legislatures. So I will leave it there. We can cover other issues and questions. Great, thanks very much, Ruth. I will pass straight on to Lord Anderson uh, since um, we're, time is running on already and we've got a lot of um, extremely interesting questions coming in. So Lord Anderson, thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, a disclaimer at the start, I can't predict what the House of Lords will do or even claim that most of us have given this bill much consideration. So this is very much um, a personal view. There was a manifesto commitment to end the supremacy of EU law and a pretty clear signal in the Queen's speech briefing back in May um, that this bill would strengthen the ability to amend, repeal or replace retained EU law um, by reducing the need to always use primary legislation to do so. So I would expect many of our concerns about this bill to focus not so much on the principle of removing supremacy, general principles and so on, uh, as on practicalities. How all this could possibly be done in 14 months I was speaking to some uh, environmental people earlier today uh, who told me that DEFRA alone owns 570 pieces of retained EU legislation, of which 70 have already been amended and 63 repealed. It's a bigger um, undertaking um, for them than the post-Brexit um, SIs. And then, of course, the impact on legal certainty, how the courts are going to manage in fields like VAT, where there's very strong reliance on, on the EU um, principles. But the constitutional concern that I can confidently predict uh, will dwarf all others uh, is going to be uh, clause 15 and the powers to revoke and replace laws arrived at by the democratic processes of the EU, uh, whether in employment law, um, consumer protection, environment, uh, and so, or, or, or others, with statutory instruments issued by government. Uh, and that will hit a very painful nerve indeed, uh, a nerve that is uh, becoming quite highly sensitized to this sort of thing. And of course, it's a subject that Ruth and the Hansard Society have made their own. Um, 
The bottom line, very briefly, is that Parliament's powers, as I'm sure you all know, are extremely weak in relation to statutory instruments. Um, neither House has any power to amend them. Uh, and in practice, the power to kill them off uh, is extremely limited. The Commons hasn't used that power since 1979. And when we last used it or, or threatened to use it in 2015, um, a minor constitutional crisis was precipitated and we were threatened with a reduction in our powers. Now that might be all right if the statutory instruments are merely implementing policies contained in statute, um, which uh, is what they, generally speaking, used to do. Uh, it's not all right if, uh, as is increasingly the case, uh, they contain matters of policy or principle made under powers in skeleton bills. That makes Parliament into a rubber stamp for the enactment of uh, policy, rather than the uh, body that um, uh, gives its uh, blessing or otherwise to uh, policy. And the lack of oversight in Parliament is compounded by the fact that such scrutiny as we are able to give deters the courts from intervening. They take their cue from Lord Sumption in the Bank Mellat case, uh, who said that where a statutory instrument has been reviewed by Parliament, respect for Parliament's constitutional function calls for considerable caution before the courts will hold it to be unlawful on some ground, which is within the ambit of, of Parliament's uh, review. Um, there's been a history of concern about this in the House of Lords, the Constitution Committee, going back uh, many years, individual crossbenchers such as Lord Judge and Lord Lisvane have often spoken on the theme. Um, a very significant development, I think, was the choreographed publication in December 2021 of reports by two extremely sober House of Lords committees, each of them chaired by a Conservative peer, um, the Secondary Legislation Scrutiny Committee, committee, whose report was called Government by Diktat, a call to return power to Parliament, and the Delegated Powers Committee, a body with no uh, Commons equivalent, which scrutinizes bills for improper delegations, and whose report was called Democracy Denied, the urgent need to rebalance the power between Parliament and the executive. Those titles were shocking and intended to shock. And, and I think we are seeing in the House of Lords growing militancy to the idea that we should be used as a rubber stamp. We saw that in a slightly different uh, context uh, earlier this year when there were an unprecedented 14 government defeats in a single evening on the police and crime bill. That was not so much about the specific public order provisions in issue as about the fact that they were being introduced only at report stage in the Lords and we were being asked effectively to, to rubber stamp them. Then in the Queen's speech debate this May, Lord Judge, former Lord Chief Justice, convener of the crossbench peers, said these words, what is the point of us being here if when we identify a serious constitutional problem, we never do anything about it except talk, and went on to encourage us to throw out exorbitant uh, delegated powers. I was one of several peers who agreed with him and predicted that it might be the Brexit Freedoms Bill, as we then thought of it, uh, by its sheer scale and audacity, um, which brought this issue to a head. On the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill, which we debated last night, um, the Delegated Powers Committee in July issued, I think, the most critical report I've ever seen. Uh, it described it as a skeleton bill that confers on ministers a license to legislate in the widest possible terms, adding that the bill represents a starker transfer of power from Parliament to the executive, as we've seen throughout the Brexit process, and described the bill as cavalier in its treatment of Parliament. So, that's the sort of tone um, uh, that has been set, uh, and that's the sort of background uh, on, on which this bill lands. So what are we going to do about it, uh, and where are, we, where are we left? Well, I, I agree with Ruth about the sifting mechanisms. Um, they're better than they might have been, um, but sifting method mechanisms uh, do nothing about the central problem, uh, which is the lack of power to uh, exert any meaningful uh, democratic scrutiny. Similarly, Section 15.4, or Clause 15.4, which places some limitations, it's, it seems to have been derived from the sort of thinking you see in the European Communities Act um, on, on the statutory instruments that can be uh, made. Uh, yes, as far as it goes, but it does nothing about the democratic deficit. Uh, this delegation of powers is so vast uh, that some of the usual expedients, for example, requiring secondary legislation to be shown in draft before the enactment of the bill, uh, don't really seem adequate to the task. I don't know uh, what we will do or what will happen um, by way of amendment. Uh, I'm sure the recommendations of our Constitution Committee and our Delegated Powers Committee uh, will be very uh, influential. But 
just off the top of my head, I would have thought there are three main perhaps groups of possibilities. Uh, one uh, would be some sort of a full-throated attack on clause 15, uh, the power to revoke or replace. Uh, very difficult, of course, because by implication, it would also impact on the deadline uh, that is central to the whole bill. But only that, it seems to me, would actually be uh, equal to the constitutional gravity of what is being proposed. Secondly, um, the possibility of subject matter exemptions. I've no doubt, you know, in, in employment law, environmental law, everyone is going to have their own ideas. And I think there are some precedents for that. Jonathan lived it more closely than I did in the, uh, the 2018 uh, Act. And then thirdly, um, assuming the bill does go through, and I'm sure it will in some form, uh, attacks on specific statutory instruments as they come through. We do have this astonishing power, it's not limited by the Parliament Acts, uh, to uh, vote down, to refuse to affirm uh, statutory instruments when they come through. As I said, we haven't tried to use it for seven years, um, but um, what is the point of having it uh, if it isn't used um, when uh, something really major and really serious comes through? Uh, to conclude, I think predictions of constitutional crisis are often uh, overdone, uh, but I do see that uh, as a real uh, possibility here, either in relation to the bill itself uh, or in relation to uh, regulations made under it uh, on sensitive policy areas. Thank you. Lord Addison, thank you very much. That's extremely useful uh, to get an insight into um, the issues that are likely to be of greatest concern to you and your colleagues when the bill uh, hits the Lords. Um, we've had a great deal, um, we've had a large number of questions in, um, and I think I will try and group some. And in order to uh, maximize our prospects of getting through quite a lot, I would, I think, ask panelists to only chip in if they've actually um, got something. It sounds rude to say if they've actually only got an answer, but don't feel any, under any obligation to um, to contribute if, if you don't. I think the first set of questions, I think, about um, what, just trying to be clear about what law is affected and how much um, uh, law is affected. So we have a question in from our good friend Graham Carey in the House of Commons Library, um, who says, how confident are we that the government has identified all or most of the section four EWA law that would be revoked under clause three of the bill we're discussing today. Um, and we have a related question, um, which is simply how accurate do we think the figure of uh, 2,400, 500 uh, affected uh, pieces of, of uh, retained EU law um, is? How accurate do we think that figure is? Perhaps, I don't know if, if Sir Jonathan would like to have a bash at either or both of those, or, or have I not got any takers? Well, I'll have a bash. Uh, the truth is, I don't, I've no idea. Um, I mean, it's helpful that there is a number, um, but whether it's correct, I don't know, but it suggests that some assessment at least has been made. Um, uh, but how accurate it is, I, I have no idea. It feels like a very large number. And the problem with the deadline that's been set, which is a very tight one, is that we can't know whether that number of instruments will get the kind of meaningful scrutiny, let alone the consultation, I've come back to this point about consultation, consulting with the affected sectors and interested parties. The idea that that can meaningfully happen in what is really a matter of months uh, is, I think, an area of concern. Um, so the truth is, I don't know how confident we can be that the government at least has identified um, all the legislation that is in scope, which after all is the entire, pretty much the entirety of EU law as it has found its way into our domestic law. Um, and that just adds to the, to the risk that a number of us have touched on. Okay, thank you. Have, has either Ruth or Lord Anderson got anything to add on that? Uh, I'll, I'll just add, Bridget, um, I mean, like Jonathan, I don't know, and I use the disclaimer, I'm not a lawyer, but of course, if the mistakes have been made, one of the things to think about uh, is that after the sunset, once a problem is discovered, we may be in the realms of, of urgent emergency legislation to plug the gap. And that will then create its own difficulties in terms of parliamentary time and um, you know, difficulties of, about the, the content of that legislation and the, the reasons that it's it's come about. Thank you. That's a, that's a helpful um, additional point. Um, I think another question we've had in that flows on um, quite naturally from that is a um, question we've had in from Charles Whitmore, who says, um, does the panel have any views 
on how the legislation might be amended to place a positive requirement on the government to avoid non-action as a means of significant policy change, i.e. they can't simply allow um, the law to fall away under the sunset and for significant policy change to come about through that means. I, I don't know whether Lord Anderson um, would like to have a bash at that um, as someone who, who will be able to table amendments to the bill. Um, thank you, Charles. The answer to your question is no, but I'd be very interested to hear of any suggestions for amendment. It does seem to me one of the areas that could be uh, profitably um, advanced. Ruth, Sir Jonathan, I don't know. Well, the, 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 it is very difficult to see how you amend the bill without eviscerating or completely removing the sunset. Because the, the, this is the problem with the sunset, is by definition, laws will lapse unless something positive is done to them. So if you reverse that, you have to take away the sunset. And then you you have an argument about what powers uh, the government has positively to choose to revoke or amend. And we might be still having the same argument about the scope of the powers, but at least you wouldn't have this cliff edge um, off which some law is going to fall. And we said it may be that some will fall by accident, but that would be a very, very major change to the, the bill and the whole idea of the sunset. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to move on um, and uh, ask you all to turn your mind to devolved matters if, if possible. Um, we've had a lot of questions in about the how this bill is going to uh, interact with uh, devolved matters, with um, the Internal Market Act and with the Northern Ireland Protocol. Um, so for example, we've got a question in from Lucy uh, Molloy, who, who is policy analyst at the House of Lords Common Frameworks Scrutiny Committee. Um, and if I can put in a plug, we had a, a blog post from them uh, we published last week about what they're up to, which was very interesting. Um, Lucy asks, if Clause 1B is enacted, what, is the, what are the implications for relations between um, the, gov the UK government and the devolved administrations, uh, particularly with regards to common frameworks. Um, as I say, we've got a question specifically about the relationship between um, this bill and the Internal Market Act. Um, and what, what happens if, um, I think this is a, a big question, what happens if devolved administrations wish to retain bits of retained EU law that the UK government doesn't want to retain, um, what, what happens um, in, in those circumstances. Um, I don't know if, if any of the panelists want to have a bash at, at these kinds of issues. As I say, we've got several questions in on them. Um, no, but in general terms, I, I saw a letter from Angus Robertson, who's the cabinet secretary in Scotland for the constitution, I think written on the 22nd of September, a letter to the UK government. And the point he makes, and one of the many points he makes, is that by allowing government ministers to act in policy areas that are devolved, and to do so without the consent of Scottish ministers or, or, or the Scottish Parliament, uh, it's, in, it's in direct contribution to uh, contradiction to, to devolution. And he sets out some of the specific areas, um, whether it's food labelling, working hours, parental leave, uh, animal welfare, uh, and, and uh, so on, uh, where he believes that will be the case. So. Um, you know, legally, um, the government's had some answers that it rather likes from the Supreme Court in recent years about the status of the Seoul Convention and its um, um, ability to ignore uh, legislative consent motions. But uh, it's obviously um, not going to be a, a happy situation in the devolved administrations. Ruth. Yeah, I mean, I, I alluded to it earlier. Um, we can't know until these these policy issues emerge because of a lack of policy detail and clarity in the bill. But um, if you think back to um, EUA, for example, the EU Withdrawal um, Act, some of the tensions with the devolved legislatures were perhaps less than they are likely to be with this bill, because that tended to focus more on regulating to regulations to deal with technical deficiencies and so on. And quite a lot of the, the, the tensions were um, therefore over quite technical matters. 
um, very clearly the tensions this time are going to be over really very highly politically salient matters of policy and, and law um, in sensitive areas where there are clear differences of view between the political parties running the different administrations. So how it will play out is difficult to say, but it's hard to avoid the concern of the fear that it is going to raise constitutional tensions to a much greater degree as a result of the way this, this bill is framed. Um, and certainly I think it's the, um, the, the Welsh government has been clear that they don't want any of this sunsetted. But as Jonathan has said, the problem with that is it eviscerates the, uh, the, the, the purpose and the approach um, to, to the bill. Okay, thanks, um, Ruth. I mean, there's we've we've just had a, another question in, which is perhaps rather provocative, but follows on from that. Um, do we think that an amendment to the bill that would remove the sunset, um, but which still left um, the the process for dealing with EU law, um, so it still left the process for dealing with EU law, but removed the sunset? Do we think such an amendment would be considered to be within scope or would it be seen as a, a wrecking amendment? This is this is the fun game of second guessing the speaker. I don't know if anybody has. Yeah, Ruth, thanks. Well, well I think if you, if you think about it politically, um, I mean, think about where the government is at the moment. It's not in a good place. Uh, there are very, very clear political divisions. Uh, both at levels of personality and, and policy direction. Um, you know, it's pretty clear from what we're hearing that there are divisions between cabinet ministers about the extent to which they want to pursue deregulation. Um, if you think about you know, the, the government's problems in managing its ventures, um, I, I merely float the possibility that once conservative backbenchers wake up to the reality that if they let these powers go through unamended and this approach is, is taken, they will have little or no traction on what happens subsequently, other than in broad political terms, in terms of influencing ministers to say, we want to keep this regulation that you want to let to, to let uh, go. But the, the problem for, for, for backbenchers is going to be that whole question about what is in rule and when will they know about it? Because there's gonna be no triggers or no parliamentary activity that's going to draw to their attention the fact that um, this, this, these regulations may, may fall away. So it's going to be dependent, I think, quite heavily on civil society to be drawing this to their attention so that they can put pressure on ministers. So I'm not entirely sure it will, it will necessarily go through in, in, in this form. OK, great. Thank you. That's helpful. Um, just um, reverting briefly back to the devolved issues, does, do, do any of our panellists have anything specifically to say about the Northern Ireland Protocol and how it's going to interact with this bill, or do we need to leave that to people who are even more expert in, in the protocol? Yep, sounds like, sounds like that that's needs to be left. Um, we've had in um, some interesting questions, some useful questions about um, impact assessments, um, uh, which are in our mind at the moment because the Secondary Legislation Scrutiny Committee in the Lords um, yesterday published, I think yesterday or on Monday, um, published um, its latest report um, as part of its programme of really drawing attention to the deficiencies in the delegated legislation um, uh, field, um, basically setting out how, how inadequate sometimes the current practice is about impact assessments. So we've had a question in asking whether or not the government would need to produce impact assessments for any replacement or restatement regulations under this bill. Um, and we've also had um, a question in or um, questioning from Ruth Chambers at Greener UK pointing out that there's no impact assessment for the bill itself at the moment um, and asking um, what might be done about that. Um, I don't know if Ruth wants to kick off on, on the question of impact assessments. Um, well, in terms of impact assessment for the regulations, again, it's very, very difficult to judge in the ab abstract because we don't know what the, what the nature of the regulations will be and any nature of, of, of change that might be proposed if, if they are to be amended. Um, and as we've seen over the last few years, it's one of the contentious points during COVID, for example, that um, a lot of instruments don't have an impact assessment 
uh, with them. There's no requirement for, for it in certain circumstances, and the Secondary Legislation Scrutiny Committee has drawn attention to that and suggested um, ways in which it could be addressed. Um, in terms of the bill, similarly, it'd be quite difficult to, to um, do the kind of impact assessments that um, you might see with a bill that's pursuing a particular economic or social policy, because so much of this is in the abstract. It's, it's powers to enable ministers to do something, the detail of which is as yet completely undefined. So it's difficult to see what that might look like. Can I just add to that? I mean, I, I agree with all of that. It's the point I'm making that th this bill passing does not of itself change the substantive law and policy anywhere, and we have no way of knowing where that might happen. What it does do is change the rules on interpreting and applying retained EU law, but again, no, no assessment has been made about the impact of that in any real world situation. Um, so that just adds to my point about, about the uncertain impact of the bill. Which, and there has indeed been no attempt to give an assessment of that. And Parliament is being asked for the first time to write itself out of the script, or very largely out of the script, in relation to very important uh, policy areas. But this is where the, the very hugeness of this bill comes in and makes it, as others have said, so very difficult to amend. Um, had it been a specific bill on a specific subject area, we might well have been able to amend by saying, um, you know, we're not going to consider this further or, um, you know, we're going to insist that um, an impact assessment or draft regulations be produced before royal assent. When the whole volume of the, of the measures under this bill is so great and the time required um, to produce them is obviously going to be great, that isn't, a, that, that isn't a, uh, an available option. And can I just come back in? Um... Ruth gave the example of financial services and market, which is a major bill in its own right, but does at least tackle, I mean, it, does, it does some similar things. It replaces and amends retained EU law in that particular sector um, in a way that uh, Parliament and the affected um, part of industry can get its brain around. I'm not getting into the detail of that, I'm not on top of it. The point is there was a specific statute a specific bill dealing with a particular sector and making the policy amendments that government wants to make. And there's, somewhere there's not your own similar bill on procurement, isn't there? Um, and you might think that is the right way to tackle, if government wants to tackle it, this accumulated body of law to change the bits it wants to change, uh, to enable more consultation and parliamentary and so on. Um, and um, that's the model uh, which this bill completely departs from and essentially writes the government a blank check. Thank you. Um, I think I'm going to move on to some, some more um, specific questions. Um, this one is possibly for uh, Sir Jonathan in the first instance. Um, this is a question in from uh, Richard Hodgson. Um, he says the, the restatement powers seem to allow the creation of corresponding or similar criminal offences or monetary penalties as were contained in retained EU law. Do you think that this unwittingly allows room for the creation of new um, offences, effectively new because they're not identical, um, new offences and penalties in secondary legislation? Well, I think it might. I mean, I'm short of now getting into the fine detail of the statute, I've got it in front of me, but we haven't really got time to do that. The fact that it enables ministers to make some adjustment and this, this test of comparable or similar um, does raise the possibility that the power may be stretched. I think David mentioned that this, some aspects of this may be modelled on the provision in the uh, European Communities Act 1972, which enabled ministers when implementing EU obligations to um, create uh, criminal offences and criminal penalties of like nature with those that previously existed and means to agonise about how much room from over that gate. Um, and so this, you know, there's a similar point here, is that how far the power can be stretched. But it must, I'd have thought, be capable of being used to extend the scope of existing criminal uh, uh, offences or penalties. And that may just be one of many areas that that Parliament needs to look at when it comes to at least reining in some of the excessive powers which the bill confers. Um, 
And just as a matter of um, statutory interpretation, it seems to me that as currently drafted, Clause 15.4 does allow the creation of criminal offences um, that do not correspond to those uh, created by the retained EU law, because um, you have the option to create offences that correspond, but in addition, the option to create criminal offences that are similar to. Those words could only be there if they're intended to refer to criminal offences that don't correspond. But of course, Jonathan's quite right. Um, there'll be amendments uh, on, on this, and uh, I'd have thought it's... Uh, the sort of uh, issue we'd be we'd be trying to concentrate on. Thank you. Um, shifting focus now um, to a parliamentary scrutiny question. Uh, this one is for Ruth. Um, and rather bizarrely, it's coming from my old boss from when I worked in the House of Commons. Um, this is um, from Kenneth Fox, who is now the clerk um, of the Bayes Select Committee in the Commons. Um, his question is, um, can anyone hazard any further um, uh, speculation, informed uh, guesswork, um, on the possible numbers and rate of flow of um, LROs under Clause 17 of the bill. Um, this is obviously relevant um, to the Bay Select Committee because the uh, House passed responsibility for scrutinising LROs um, to the Bay Select Committee uh, not so long ago. Um, Ruth. Well, I, I hesitate to be definitive, but I, I think it will be small in number. I mean, if you think that there have been less than 40 since 2006, since they were first introduced, um, if you consider that um, it requires consultation, it requires an extended scrutiny period, um, the scrutiny committee can propose amendments to the instrument, which of course is very rare. The, you know, delegated legislation cannot normally be uh, amended. Um, and there is also a committee veto, which is why it's at the, the upper end of the, the strength and scrutiny process. Um, the committee can, can, can veto it. Um, that's why there have been so few. But there's also post-legislative review of um, the LRO process a few years ago. Um, civil servants, when they looked at this, found that the time period, you know, it's very time consuming. It can take between 10 and 14 months for an LRO to go through all its all its stages. So why would you bother with it when there may be the possibility of using one of the existing powers in the bill as a form of least resistance, you know, much quicker, much easier. Um, but also, you know, it would ar arguably be quicker to take a bill through than it would to, to, to possibly use the LRO procedure. So I think it's a backstop, um, but I'd be very, very surprised um, if we have many of them. Great, that's very clear. Um, I'm going to pop one more question, no, two more questions, I think, um, if we've got time. Um, one, one more specific question. Um, is it also your understanding that clauses 12, 13 and 15 can only be used on a piece of retained EU law or assimilated law once. Um, and does that mean that um, if a drafting error or other mistake were made when um, restating, revoking or replacing it, that we'd end up needing primary legislation anyway? Uh, that may be, may be too intricate a question, but um, it would be interesting to hear different, different views if there are any. Um, maybe too intricate a question. I haven't thought about it. I mean, one thing is that there's there is a deadline on the use of that power, on the use of all of these powers. So there is a sense to which you know, if you haven't got something right by the by that deadline, then you've lost the power to do anything about it. I haven't worked out whether, um, I mean, normally powers can be exercised repeatedly, but whether this works in this case because while the power while the time you've exercised it once, the law ceases to be retained. Um, and therefore the power falls away, or whether you can then use the power to restate assimilated law, that's, I think you're getting into a bit of, um, it's a very interesting question, but I don't know the answer. Lord Anderson, do you have anything to add on that or not? Not really. Um, <laughs> I would imagine that if we get a restatement slightly wrong, there could be no objection to amending the regulation, and from that it's quite a short step to restating something twice, but honestly, I've not thought about it, and I wouldn't want anyone to rely on any preliminary view I might have. 
Okay, um, we, we're just up against, um, coming up against time and um, our apologies that we haven't um, had a chance to address all of your questions. Um, uh, it's great that um, people have been asking so many. Clearly the, the interaction between this bill and devolved matters um, is, is a particular area that um, is going to come up and is of interest and, and we're all going to need to try and get our heads around. Um, if I could, I would ask um, one sort of final wrap up question if all three panelists um, could could have a think about this or have a go at addressing this one. This is in from Meg Russell at the Constitution Unit at, at uh, UCL, um, which is um, effectively what what are your what's your amendment strategy or what are your top amendments? Um, and in, and overall, would you are you going to try and would you go for sort of small, quite technical things um, to try and um, remedy some of the concerns that you've raised? Or do you think it would be better to just say this entire bill is conceptually flawed and we're not having it? <laughs> I don't know if Lord Anderson uh, wants to uh, have a go with that. Yeah, well, my instinct, as you probably guessed, is, is to go in very hard indeed on Clause 15. It seems to me an outrageous assault on the powers of Parliament. And it seems that we will be replacing laws arrived at by a democratic process. Um, with laws that aren't really arrived at by a democratic process, and that's very serious indeed. The only thing I would add, Ruth mentioned the significance of Conservative backbenches in the Commons to the possible progress of this bill. I agree. I think the other most influential group can have as many high-minded crossbenches as you like, but you never get anything through without the support of the opposition. And as the Labour frontbench possibly begins to uh, scent power a little more urgently than, than may have been the case a few years ago, uh, it's an open question for me as to how committed um, they are going to be in pursuit of these uh, these constitutional points. So, Jonathan? Well, I didn't get a say as it goes through Parliament, but I mean, I think that, that this is a very flawed way of making law. Uh, as I've said before, this is not anything about the merits of Brexit. This is about how we make law in the UK. And I think this is a very flawed way of doing it. So I wouldn't start from here. If I had to, I mean, I would get rid of the, the, the sunset and then have an argument about the scope of the powers. Um, and the powers can then be exercised when the government is good and ready and has done some thinking and cons consulting without the, the cliff edge. But whether that is remotely feasible politically or parliamentarily, um, I, I doubt. But that's that, ideally, that's what I would concentrate on. Thank you. Um, Ruth? Well, I mean, I, I broadly mirror that. I think a lot depends in terms of approach on what the appetite is amongst Conservative backbenchers, what their attitude is, and, and, and is there an appetite for amending this and, and for, you know, trying to take to, to change the conceptual approach to to, um, to to the bill. If there isn't, then you're down to looking at specific amendments to to narrow the powers to, to tackle the ambiguous wording and so on. Um, but you, you, you're then still going to have to deal later with the, the problems that flow from it in terms of um, in terms of the lack of scrutiny for for, for MPs. Great, um, thank you. Um, as I say, I know there are plenty of questions that we've had in um, that we haven't been able to address. We will gather them up, um, and they will certainly inform our further work on the bill uh, as we go forward. Um, we at the Hansard Society will certainly be producing a briefing paper on the bill. And I know that um, several other organizations either have already or are producing um, similar bills. Um, we'll obviously keep an eye out for the date for second reading and for further stages in parliament. Um, and I should also mention that um, as and when the bill is enacted and uh, the statutory instruments to be made under it um, come through. Um, the, we at the Hansard Society will be monitoring them um, as we monitor all statutory instruments that are laid before Parliament um, with our um, statutory instrument tracker service. Um, I'm afraid you're not going to get away without a bit of a, a bit of a plea. Um, if you have enjoyed today's uh, webinar and found it useful, um, we are a charity. Um, if you would like to support our work, that would be fantastic. Um, follow us on Twitter, sign up to our newsletter, um, in, um, invitations to make donations or become a member are all on our website and your support is all um, much, much appreciated. 
Um, but for now, I would like to thank very much um, all three of our panelists. I think it's been a really useful discussion. Um, clearly an awful lot more work to do on the bill um, going forward. But for now, um, thank you very much. Um, Ruth, our director, um, Lord Anderson of Ipswich and Sir Jonathan Jones Casey. Thank you. <laughs>